Alrighty. Thank you all for coming, all right, especially battling the DC traffic. Uh, I want to thank you all and thank Dr. Sullivan for making his way out from Detroit on his March to the Sea. Not self-titled March to the Sea. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, a.k.a. Sully, is an emergency physician, physiologist, and starting strength coach. He's the owner-operator of Gray Steel Strength and Conditioning, a coaching practice dedicated to improving the strength and fitness of adults from their 40s to their 90s. He writes frequently on health, strength, and fitness, and his articles can be found at startingstrength.com and graysteel.org. He is the host of the Gray Steel channel on YouTube, which is devoted to information on healthy aging. He is a founding member of the Starting Strength Coaches Association, and he has served on several of its committees, including the Science and Maintenance of Certification Committee. So he graduated from the University of Arizona College of Medicine in 1992 and earned his PhD in physiology from Wayne State University in 1998. He's an associate professor of emergency medicine at Wayne State University and attending physician at Detroit Receiving Hospital, a level one trauma center in Southeast Michigan. He served as associate director of the Wayne State University Emergency Medicine Cerebral Resuscitation Laboratory, where his research focused on brain injury and repair after stroke, trauma, and cardiac arrest. He has published dozens of articles, abstracts, and books, and book chapters on these topics. He is a member of the United States Marine Corps, and we are honored to welcome him here tonight. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Um, appreciate uh, Daniel Raimondi's introductory remarks, and uh, he and his wife, Gemma, and their beautiful little baby Marcy have been taking good care of me all day and including getting me through the <laughs> the traffic the local I don't know how you people do it it was like <laughs> I was like in awe of the traffic uh, getting here tonight nothing like that where I'm coming from I thought the traffic was bad there um, we're starting actually I guess a little tiny bit later than advertised um, but uh, we have plenty of time to get through this and then maybe a little bit of Q&A afterwards and again, I really appreciate you all coming to hear crazy ER doctor talk about weightlifting. So I, I guess this is why we're here. Uh, this is uh, our new book. We're really proud of it. Um, uh, the Barbell Prescription, Strength Training for Life After 40, was just released in December of uh, 2016 by the Asgard Company. This uh, was a four-year writing project. Uh, the book is... Uh, uh, 300 some odd pages long. It has over 500 citations from the peer-reviewed biomedical literature, uh, full appendix, index, um, and I think I can say without fear of contradiction that uh, there is nothing else like it anywhere, uh, this book. It's not like any other training or exercise book uh, that you've ever read before. There you go. There it is. And, um, and uh, I'm going to tell you about it tonight. Um, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I am going to tell you about it tonight. Um, this was co-written with my friend and colleague and fellow coach, Andy Baker, starting strength coach. Andy is the owner and operator of Kingwood Strength and Conditioning in Kingwood, Texas. And that is a starting strength gym. And like me, Andy is very interested in training adults over 50, uh, and in particular in programming strength training for adults over 50, He's kind of a genius at it. Um, and part three of the book, uh, where we lay out uh, programs and all of their possible permutations and how they can be adapted in any individual situation, that's the part of the book where Andy really shines. Um, first part of the book is my part of the book, where we talk about why the barbell prescription fits the bill as an exercise prescription for older adults. And then uh, Andy and I kind of meet in the middle in part two to talk about the exercises and training and so forth. And we'll see that as we go on. So I want to make sure that I tip my hat to my co-author, Andy. This is why we wrote it, right? Adults over 40, a growing segment of the population um, with a particular constellation of diseases of aging, degenerative diseases of aging, um, the knowledge that exercise is a powerful medicine for the degenerative diseases of aging, and the need to put together a definitive exercise prescription. But Here's the guts of it, right? The guts of it is this. We don't grow old and die the way we used to. We grow old and die differently now. 
And by the way we used to, I mean like the previous one and a half, two million years of human um, survival on this planet. For most of our history, the vast majority of our history, except for this tiny sliver of the modern era, right, we have died primarily from infectious diseases when we didn't die from trauma or starvation or an arrow in the back, right? So most of our history, we died from infectious diseases. We died, we died in childbirth from infectious diseases. We died in young adulthood from infectious diseases. We died in old age from infectious diseases. We died of smallpox. We died of malaria. Malaria brought down whole civilizations. Alexander the Great probably died of malaria. Rome was probably brought down in part by malaria. Cholera and the dysenteries. It's staggering to think back how many millions or billions of our ancestors just diarrheaed to death, right, over time, like they still do in some undeveloped countries. Smallpox, tuberculosis, or pink eye, or influenza, or a tooth abscess, or a minor skin infection, or a minor pneumococcal pneumonia, right? That's how we used to die. We don't die like that anymore. We, we die differently. We grow old differently than we used to. Now when we die, we tend to die from diseases of peace, plenty, abundance, and relative longevity, relatively long life. We grow old enough to get prostate cancer. We grow old enough to get leukemias. We die of the chronic degenerative diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. And when we do die of infectious diseases, we tend to do so at the extremes of old age and of illness. We've been weakened by the chronic degenerative diseases of aging, of our, by our congestive heart failure and our diabetes, and they've set us up to die of infectious diseases. So the way we age now and the way we die now is different. We have different aging and death phenotypes than we used to. Phenotype is a word that we use a lot in the book. It's from the ancient Greek, phinen and typos, which basically means show and type. A phenotype is the show type of an organism. It's the actual set of characteristics that we observe when we look at that organism, independent of its genotype. The two organisms can have very similar genotypes, like you and Alexander the Great, right? But you can have very different phenotypes depending upon your experiences, your environment, the time in which you live, and so on. So, we age differently, we die differently. And this has brought about a realization that our current approach to medicine, our disease-oriented approach to medicine, has certain limitations which are becoming acutely apparent as the population gets older and these diseases become more prevalent. And along with that has come a growing realization of the value of exercise as medicine. This is not a new observation. Hippocrates talked about it in ancient Greece. Galen talked about it in ancient Rome. Paracelsus talked about it in medieval Germany. But the emphasis on lifestyle factors and exercise as a medicine was lost in the modern era with the emergence of the disease-oriented model of medical practice. Well, now we see this growing body of literature on the value of exercise as a medicine for the maintenance of health, particularly in elderly populations. And it's become very, very fashionable to talk about exercise as a medicine. American College of Sports Medicine has this global initiative called Exercise is Medicine, right? They even trademarked the term, which is kind of weird, I think. It's like trademarking two plus two equals four, or you know, insulin controls blood sugar, but whatever, right? So people talk about exercise as a medicine. But here's the problem. In my whole career, I've never written a prescription that said medicine. All right, medicine, here's your prescription. Antibiotics, take your medicine. High blood pressure medicine, here's your prescription, right? No doctor would ever write a prescription like that because that would be stupid, right? 
An exercise prescription has to be like any other prescription. A prescription specifies the medicine, its formulation, its route of administration, its frequency of administration, its duration, and ideally its therapeutic targets or at least the condition that's being treated. That is a prescription. So a doctor who wouldn't dream of writing a prescription that said, just take some medicine, won't blink when he tells his patient, just get some exercise. Get some exercise, will you? Well, that won't do. If, as the biomedical literature tells us, exercise is a medicine, and in fact, the most powerful lifestyle medicine that we have available to us to fight the degeneration of chronic, disease, uh, chronic aging, then we should prescribe it as a medicine. And that's one of the things that this book set out to do. Boy, I think I just screwed up. Here we go. Here we are. So, the book is divided into three parts. The why is to do exactly what I just told you. To lay out the criteria for an exercise medicine prescription, its prescription requirements, and the therapeutic targets that we're trying to treat. Part two is, once we've decided what that exercise medicine is going to look like, here's a spoiler, it's going to be strength training with barbells plus a conditioning component, <laughs> then to give you an overview of those exercises and those conditioning components. In other words, the formulation of the exercise medicine. And then part three is the how. It's the nubby nitty gritty. It's how the exercise prescription is administered, individualized, monitored and modulated over time to produce a maximal therapeutic benefit over time. The prescription is a program. Here's the whole book in a nutshell. The exercise prescription for the aging adult is a training program for the master's athlete. The exercise prescription for the aging adult is a training program for the master's athlete. That should become more clear as the evening proceeds. So, part one, why? The focus here is on formulating a general exercise prescription. And to do that, you have to know what you're treating. You have to know what your therapeutic target is. And our therapeutic target is the sick aging phenotype, which I'm going to tell you about in just a moment. And because it's an exercise prescription, we're nominally interested in physical fitness here. That's one of the things that we're trying to do. So we have to understand what physical fitness is, and we have to understand what its components are, because we would like our exercise prescription to be as comprehensive with regard to physical fitness as possible, to the general fitness attributes and to the biological energy systems that allow us to engage in physical activity. And finally, our exercise prescription has to meet the criteria that any medical prescription must meet. It's a, if it's a medicine, it must meet the same criteria as any other prescription. So, here's what we're treating. The sick aging phenotype. Now, I've written about this at length and in the book and elsewhere. I've talked about it on YouTube and in various other media. And so, I'm not going to belabor it too much here. Um, it's a topic that I could talk about for several hours. If called upon to do so, I would be delighted to do so, but that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. I'm just going to give you an overview of what we're talking about here. The sick aging phenotype is a product of my own fevered imagination, and it comes out of my experience for 25 years as an emergency physician caring primarily for adults in the emergency department, in the critical care unit, and elsewhere. It's basically something that I have seen over and over and over again thousands of times. It is, in fact, a syndrome. That's what a syndrome is. A syndrome is something that doctors see over and over and over again, a constellation of signs and symptoms that always seem to go together. That's what a syndrome is. The sick aging phenotype is a syndrome of syndromes. It's a collection of syndromes that always, that always tend to go together in people who age poorly. When people age poorly, they demonstrate some constellation of features from the sick aging phenotype. And this is what it is. The sick aging phenotype is sarcopenia, osteopenia, and frailty in the top tier. 
Sarcopenia is just a fancy word that means loss of muscle mass. Loss of muscle mass. You lose muscle as you get older. You can lose up to a half a kilogram or a kilogram per year over 50 or 60. Okay, that's what happens. You get old, you lose muscle. Losing muscle is a catastrophe in the aging adult. It is nothing short of a catastrophe. Not just because we're weaker, but because muscle is a profoundly important organ. Not just a motor organ. It's a metabolic organ. It's an endocrine organ. So the loss of muscle mass has huge implications for us as we grow older. And osteopenia, the loss of bone mineral density. Now you know that's bad, right? All of our lives have been touched by, the, by that. By an old friend or a grandmother or a grandfather who fell and broke their hip. And if that's happened to you in your family, you know that that is a disaster for an older adult to fall and break one's hip. And frailty. Frailty is a well-recognized geriatric syndrome, has differing definitions. Gerontologists love to talk about it. Here's the guts of it. Here it is in a nutshell. Frailty just means you're easy to break. It means that a pneumonia that a young person can shake off in a week or two is going to kill you. At the very least, it'll put you in the ICU. It means that a fall that would leave a younger person or a stronger person with a bad bruise, you're going to break your hip. You're going to break your back. Frailty means you're easy to break. It goes with loss of independence, loss of function, and ultimately with loss of dignity and hope. The second component and the keystone, really, of the sick aging phenotype is the metabolic syndrome, what used to be called Syndrome X. It was kind of coming into prominence when I was in medical school and a young intern. And people started talking about diattention obesity. It's a classic syndrome kind of thing. Things that always go together. Yeah, that guy's got diattention obesity. He's got that syndrome X that we're starting to hear about. The metabolic syndrome. Diattention obesity. Diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, obesity. Diattention obesity. Metabolic syndrome. Why? Because they always go together. And that's not coincidence. It's because they're causally and pathophysiologically linked. The current major definition of the metabolic syndrome kind of depends on who you read, is obesity, or a big belly, big trunk to waist ratio. But what you're really talking about here at a pathophysiological level is not just the fat on your belly. It's the fat in your belly. Not the fat on the outside of your abdominal wall. It's the fat inside your abdominal cavity and inside your thoracic cavity. It's the fat surrounding your internal organs. Visceral obesity. Because that fat is different from the fat I have on my butt here and the fat I have right here. Visceral fat is a different kind of fat. It's sick fat. It's pro-inflammatory fat. It's fat that helps drive the metabolic syndrome. Because fat is also an endocrine organ. And the way it signals to the rest of your body is different depending on whether it's healthy fat or sick fat. Insulin resistance and elevated fasting blood glucose. This basically just means that your tissues are resistant to insulin signaling. You make insulin because you're not a type 1 diabetic. You make insulin but your cells are resistant to that hormonal signal from insulin. And that causes your blood sugar to go up. But that's not even close to being the end of it. So again, the loss of insulin signaling is a catastrophe for the older adult. Because the effects of insulin go far beyond blood sugar. Insulin is a growth factor. It's a survival factor. It's a trophic factor. And its effects on gene expression and metabolism in every tissue at every level are profound. Hypertension is high blood pressure. You know that's bad. Bad for your brain, bad for your eyes, bad for your kidneys, bad for your coronary arteries, bad for your cerebral vascular circulation. It's just bad. When your blood pressure is high, every single heartbeat hammers your capillary beds throughout your body with that elevated blood pressure. 
What's the connection between obesity and insulin resistance and hypertension? It's been well described at a physiological level. You can draw a direct line from visceral obesity to insulin resistance to high blood pressure. And dyslipidemia, right, basically means your serum lipids are screwed up. Your good cholesterol is too low, your bad cholesterol is too high, and your serum triglycerides are elevated. Your serum fats are elevated. Sometimes to the point where we draw blood on you because you're in the emergency department again, and we get your blood, and what do we get? We get a strawberry milkshake. It's not red. It's pink. It's strawberry milkshake because your blood is so full of fat. I've seen it many times, right? Add to that systemic inflammation. This is not the kind of inflammation you get when you get a cold or you cut your finger or you sprain your ankle, right? This is more of a chronic inflammation, a chronic, simmering, systemic inflammation that slowly but steadily inflicts damage on tissues throughout the body over time. It's not part of the classical definition of the metabolic syndrome, because, but I think it should be because it's directly related to insulin resistance and systemic inflammation and the metabolic syndrome always seem to go together. Finally, polypharmacy and medical dependence. What is polypharmacy? It's just a fancy word that means a lot of drugs. It's a disease, epidemic in industrialized countries. Easily diagnosed when the nice lady comes to the emergency department with a Walgreens shopping bag full of 30 prescription pill bottles. Prescribed by a bunch of different doctors. She has no idea what they're all doing. She has four different blood pressure medicines. She has two different oral hypoglycemics, right? She has medicine to make her pee. So she has, she has Lasix, a potassium-wasting diuretic. She has aldactone, a potassium-sparing diuretic. Right? She has Lamotil for her diarrhea. She has Senna for her constipation. She has pain medicines. She has muscle relaxants. She has sleeping pills. And she complains that she's dizzy all the time. So some, uh, eventually somebody's going to give her another pill for dizziness. It's crazy. This is a disease that kills people. And she has medical dependence. Goes hand in hand with polypharmacy. What does that mean? It means that this person spends a disproportionate amount of their life under medical care. Always at the doctor's office. Always seeing a specialist. Always getting an imaging procedure. Always being admitted. Always in the emergency department. Always taking medicine medically dependent. So that's the metabolic syndrome. You kind of know it when you see it. This is an extreme example of it. There you go. You got the Coca-Cola IV, you got the remote control, you got the iPhone, you got the auto feeder with hoppers from McDonald's and KFC right to your door. You got the big hopper of meds feeding right into the chair. I see you smiling and hear you laughing out there. And yeah, it's a pretty cool image. I, I smiled and laughed when I saw it. This, Stephen King never wrote about anything so horrible. The human suffering represented by this image is unspeakable. And it's actually not that much of an exaggeration in my experience. So I'm sick of it. And I kind of wanted to do something about it. This is an extreme kind of case, but we see a whole spectrum of the sick aging phenotype, and it progresses over time. I've written about the sick aging phenotype in rather more grisly detail in the book and elsewhere, and I'm not going to go into the details of it uh, like on this slide. This is simply to indicate two things to you, the level of detail that we wrote about it in the book, and secondly, to un to underscore, well, really three things. Secondly, to underscore the central role of insulin resistance in the elaboration of this phenotype. And thirdly, to show you something about the pathophysiology of this syndrome of syndromes. How the processes that lead to its development become progressively more interconnected and synergistic over time. When you have a pathophysiological process that you map out and you start seeing arrows pointing in two different directions, both to and from a cause, that's trouble. That means 
that you have a pathophysiologic process that's getting dug in and it's going to be extremely difficult to treat. If you do, if, if you do find a medicine that's going to be effective against it, it's going to be a powerful medicine. And it may not be entirely effective. So that's our target, the sick aging phenotype. Now, the exercise prescription has to meet the same criteria as any other medical prescription. It has to be safe. You can't hurt people just to make them healthier. Right? That's what doctors are for. <laughs> right? You don't want to hurt people just to make them healthier. You want your exercise medicine to be safe. You want your exercise medicine to have a wide therapeutic window. What do I mean by that? You want to have a lot of daylight between your minimum effective dose and your minimum toxic dose. We love medicines like that, right? So let's say I want to treat you with a medicine. Minimum effective dose is 50 milligrams. Minimum toxic dose is 60 milligrams. You excited about that? Yeah, exactly. You better not mess it up. Doctors hate those medicines. It's just you have to you have to be so careful. It's too easy to hurt people and it's too easy to have a treatment failure. Right? We hate those medicines. We like medicines that have a wide therapeutic window with a lot of available doses between the minimum and the maximum dose. In other words, our exercise medicine should be exquisitely dosable. We want our exercise medicine to be comprehensive. In other words, we want it to address as many general fitness attributes and biological energy systems as possible. And we'll talk about those. We want it to be specific. We don't want to treat asthma with an anti-cancer medicine. We don't want to treat high blood pressure with a diabetes medicine. We want our exercise medicine to be specific. Specific to what? The sick aging phenotype. We want it to have activity against the sick aging phenotype. And finally, we want it to be efficient and as simple as possible, but no simpler. Right? We want an exercise medicine that we can administer effectively and simply with a minimum of fuss and in the minimum amount of time necessary to get the job done. Because grandkids and our job and life wait for no medicine. What are these fitness attributes I've been talking about? This is the comprehensive requirement. We want our exercise medicine to be comprehensive. Well, first of all, we have to understand what fitness is. What is fitness? It's kind of interesting. I go around the country. I ask fitness professionals and exercise physiology students and doctors, like, what is fitness? Anybody got an answer for me? It's like, no. Fitness is the capacity of an organism to meet the physical demands of its life and its environment. That's fitness. And different people have unpacked the components of fitness in different ways. You'll see different kinds of lists. Most of them look more or less like this. This is the list that we use in the book. We think we get to all the components of the physical fitness attributes with this list. Strength is the ability to generate force against an external resistance. And we maintain that it is the most fundamental fitness attribute. Why? Because it's the ability to generate a force against resistance. And force is something that accelerates a mass. In other words, force is that thing that produces movement. There is no movement without force. There's no stopping movement without force. Force is the ability to produce movement. Thank you, Isaac Newton. Right? And without movement, all the other fitness attributes become kind of irrelevant. Life is movement. Power is simply strength displayed quickly. Technically, it's the amount of work delivered or energy expended per unit of time. Right? Work is force times velocity. So it's what the German exercise physiologists call speed strength. Right? It's a pretty good description of it. And it's important. You may be strong enough to stand up off the toilet, but if it takes you all day, you are in serious trouble. And it is really the most critical athletic attribute. Most sports depend on the efficient expression of power. Mobility is pretty much what you think it would be. It's flexibility. It's the ability 
to manifest a complete natural range of motion strongly and gracefully. So we would include also in this agility, for example. Balance is the ability to maintain a stable center of mass, a stable position, either statically or dynamically in the gravitational field. Endurance is the ability to engage in sustained physical activity, right? It's what we typically associate with aerobic training and is strongly correlated with cardiovascular health in classical exercise, physiology, and medical thinking. And body composition. Most athletes are interested in their body composition, and, and most doctors are interested in your body composition in general. We'd like you to have more muscle, more bone, less fat. And in this context, we would particularly be interested in you having less visceral fat, less sick fat, less pro-inflammatory fat. So those are the fitness attributes that we would like our general exercise prescription to address. Now, after about 100 pages of looking at the literature, of looking at the physiology, of looking at all of the options available to us, we reach the conclusion that strength training with barbells attacks the sick aging phenotype. It addresses the metabolic syndrome. Why? Because like any vigorous form of exercise, not just barbells, any vigorous form of exercise, any intense exercise, improves insulin sensitivity, and insulin sensitivity is the cornerstone of the metabolic syndrome. So any sufficiently intense exercise will improve insulin sensitivity and fight the metabolic syndrome, not just barbells. But not every form of exercise will address sarcopenia and osteopenia. And we definitely need to do that for reasons that are discussed in great detail in the book and which we can talk about later if you'd like. We need to increase bone mineral density and we need to increase muscle mass and muscle function. And there, resistance training with barbells shines. And we need to decrease the systemic inflammation that is a co-traveler with the metabolic syndrome. And again, barbells work here because almost any vigorous form of exercise works here. Does strength training with barbells attack polypharmacy and medical dependence? And I have to tell you I don't know because we don't know if any form of exercise medicine does that. Hasn't been well studied enough to say. But there's no reason to believe that to the extent any form of exercise medicine addresses these two components of the sick aging phenotype, that barbell training wouldn't do just as well or better. Strength training with barbells addresses the entire range of fitness attributes. And, and this is where some people sort of scratch their heads and look at us. But it's true. Strength training, for one, improves strength. Hence the name, right? And it improves power. How does it do that? Mostly by improving strength. Because strength is just speed, dis or, uh, 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 power is just strength displayed quickly. So when you make somebody stronger, you make them more powerful by definition. There are barbell training approaches to making somebody specifically more powerful as well. Strength training improves endurance. Damn it. It does. There's a long-standing, pervasive, pernicious mythology that if you train for strength with barbells, yeah, you're going to get strong. You're going to be this great big Michelin man. You're going to be strong. You're going to be huge. You're going to be able to deadlift 1,050 pounds, right? But you're going to be out of breath walking to the parking lot. Well, it is possible to find such extreme examples. But people who train for health with barbells improve their exercise capacity and they improve their endurance performance. The literature is still split on whether they improve biomarkers of aerobic metabolism. VO2 max, citrate synthase activity, and so on. But even that view is starting to break down, especially in older adults. And it is the universal field experience of everybody who works in strength and conditioning that when you make people stronger, you improve their endurance. When you take an untrained individual and you make them stronger, you improve their endurance. You just do by making them strong. And there are multiple pathways, multiple mechanisms underlying this phenomenon. We improve mobility with barbells. 
Again, a very widespread, pernicious mythology. If you train with barbells, you're going to get stiff, you're going to get muscle-bound, you're going to lose mobility. It's quite the opposite. When we make people stronger throughout the entire range of motion, we usually end up improving their range of motion. We improve their mobility. A lot of the exercises that I'm going to show you tonight, they're kind of like stretches, actually, in a way. And people end up prove, improving their mobility, particularly their hip, their shoulder, and their lower back mobility with these exercises. You improve balance if you do the exercises correctly, if you do the kinds of barbell exercises I'm going to tell you about, because these exercises are performed standing up with the barbell on the back or in the hand. And when you perform an exercise standing up, you introduce the very real possibility of falling down. And we would prefer that you not fall down with the barbell. That's never part of the exercise. So when you train under increasing loads, the ability to not fall down, you improve your balance. When you describe a normal, full, complete, natural range of motion loaded under a barbell and don't fall down, you are improving your balance. And balance is a function of strength anyway, right? So trip, catch yourself, maintain your normal body position either statically or dynamically. That's done through the expression of force against the ground reaction force, against the floor. It takes strength. To, have you ever noticed that strong people don't fall down a lot? <laughs> and body composition. More muscle, more bone, less fat, particularly visceral fat. And resistance training has been studied specifically in regards to the accumulation and the resolution of visceral fat. So, our conclusion is that strength training with barbells meets the criteria of our general exercise prescription. It is safe. It's incredibly safe. It's just about the safest form of exercise that you can do. It has a wide therapeutic window. What do I mean by that? Well, we have broomsticks. You can start using this program with broomsticks. You can start by pressing and deadlifting and squatting a, an extremely light bar. And we have plates. I can add as little as a half a pound to somebody's bar if I want to. So it's exquisitely dosable. The therapeutic window is bigger than any other medicine I've ever encountered. It's comprehensive. It addresses all of the general fitness attributes to one degree or another. It attacks the sick aging phenotype, as we've just seen. And it is simple and efficient. Two days a week is all I ask. 90 minutes twice a week. That's what we do at my shop. 90 minutes twice a week. And I can get a little old lady who can barely stand up out of her chair to a 100, 125, 150 pound squat in a year. I can get her to a 175, 200 pound deadlift in a year, a year and a half. Two days a week, 90 minutes each. Four exercises. Just four exercises and a conditioning component because when we add a conditioning component to strength training, the literature tells us that we are just cooking with gas then. The results are more than additive. The addition of a simple conditioning component to barbell training is a force multiplier. Just four exercises. So you'll notice that one of the criteria of our exercise prescription was not to entertain you and to keep changing things up for variety and to keep things interesting. Not the same four exercises day in and day out, baby, because I am not going to change them up just to entertain you or to keep things fresh and interesting. Any more than your doctor is going to change your diabetes medicine from one week to the next to keep things fresh and interesting, right? It would be interesting, but you would start to think that something was kind of wrong, wouldn't you? Our exercise medicine is the same. So, having gotten to this point, our next question, our next part of the book is what? Four big multi-joint exercises and a conditioning component. And when it comes to that, what we're talking about are just normal human movement patterns loaded with barbells. We are interested in movements. Four great big movement patterns that form the building blocks of our physical lives. 
sitting down, standing up, putting things overhead, picking heavy stuff off the floor, push, pull, right? We aren't interested in specific muscles. You come to my gym, I'm not going to say, let's, let's hit your hams today. Let's hit the hammies today. Let's work your quads. Let's blast your calves. Let's work the biceps. Let's hit your traps. Let, let's focus your glutes, right? Let, we don't do that, right? You're not going to come to my gym and, like, work on your hamstrings like in the machine. Like, who does that? Who, do, who does that in their life? Uh, right? <laughs> We're not interested in that. We're interested in great big human movement patterns. When we make the movement pattern stronger, we make the individual stronger. And we also strengthen every single component that contributes to that movement pattern. Every muscle, every joint, every tendon, every ligament, every nerve, every sinew that contributes to that movement pattern is called upon to contribute its naturally correct share at the correct time during that movement pattern. So don't have to worry that your quads and your hams are unbalanced, right? I just have to make that movement stronger. And it will grow stronger in a balanced, natural way. And here they are. The squat. You sit down, you stand up. You sit down, you stand up. With a heavy bar on your back. Which allows us to make that movement pattern stronger and stronger and stronger over time. This is an incredibly intense exercise for the development of general strength. It makes everything strong. It makes all the other exercises stronger. It has a huge endocrine response. It captures a vast volume of muscle tissue. This is Anne. She's warming up to her work set of 135 pounds for a set of three. She's got 105 on the bar here. Anne is a retired nurse. She's 75 years old. She's going to be our model tonight. And a sweetheart. What if you can't do that? We have an app for that. Right? Actually, we have a bunch of different apps for that. Right? So say you can't get down there and stand back up again. It's almost always because of strength, not because of mobility. It's always, almost always because you're not strong enough to get out of the hole. So we have approaches that we can use, like this illustration from the book, using graded bungee cord squats across the rack. He squats this way for a week, to that depth, he gets stronger, we lower the bungee cord, he squats that way for a week, he gets stronger, we lower the bungee cord, until we get him below parallel, and then we put a light bar on his back. And then we're off to the races. Right? We have any number of remedial squat exercises and squat programs in the book to enable just about anybody access to this exercise or one of its variants. Here's Ann warming up with 135 on the bar. Even in North America, we still have to bend over and pick stuff up sometimes, right? Your iPhone can't do that yet, right? So obviously, Ann is training her lower extremities. She's training her hips. She's training her butt. You might appreciate watching her pull this heavy weight that she's also training her grip and her upper body, right? You think the deadlift is not an upper body exercise. Go watch somebody really strong do a heavy deadlift with their shirt off sometime, right? It is, it is also an upper body exercise. But something much more fundamental is happening here. Not only is Anne recruiting a huge volume of muscle tissue and improving her insulin sensitivity, right? And, and stressing the bones of her axial skeleton, her hips and her spine, in a way that will promote bone mineral density. She's doing something else. She is teaching her back to be a force conduit. Because the force that she's generating with her legs and her hips has to be transmitted through her back to her shoulders, down her arms, to load in her hand, or it's not going to move. With an exercise like this, an exercise like the squat, and an exercise like the press, Anne is training her back to be a force transmitter, to transmit force rather than to bow to it. This makes her back stronger. And when your back is stronger, you're harder to break. And you're more useful, right? The guy who can bend over and pick up the keg is always one of the most popular guys at the party, right? This exercise is accessible to almost everybody. 
Almost anybody can do this exercise, as you'll see. But what if you can't? We have apps for that. Most of them involve elevating the barbell until we get your back into a position where it can be an effective force transmitter. And you train it to work in that position and get it stronger over time until we can put the bar on, on the floor. But there are other remedial exercises, replacement exercises, and accessory movements in the book that can be used to prescribe this particular exercise medicine to almost any individual, regardless of their limitations. That's what we wanted to do with this book. Here's Anne performing the overhead press. Oh my God, she's going she's gonna to kill her shoulders. This, this is going to destroy her shoulders. Oh my God. That's what she heard from her, you know, from her doctor. Nothing could be further from the truth. Anne has improved her shoulder mobility and strength and durability with this exercise. Right? This is pretty good shoulder mobility for a 75-year-old woman. In my experience, it's pretty good shoulder mobility for a 40-year-old man. A lot of 40-year-old men walk into my gym, and they don't have that kind of shoulder mobility and that kind of strength. You know, the guy, the guy who just started with us there in the background, he's watching, and uh, I wish I could do that. <laughs> yeah, he will, he will, right? And once again, you can see that Anne has to use her spine as a force transmitter. And she has, to, she has to stabilize the load over her head, not just with her arms and her shoulders, but with her legs and her hips and her entire trunk. Nobody has thicker, stronger abs than somebody with a great, big, strong press, except for somebody with a stronger press. Do a few sets, and you'll know what I mean. The so-called core muscles get a big workout with this exercise. If you can't do it, we have an app for that. We have multiple approaches. Shoulder mobility limitations are very common. Sometimes these exercises improve them, and sometimes shoulder mobility limitations are fixed. But we can get almost anybody to do some form of press or standing upper body movement. And of course, the bench press, you're talking about, talking about barbells. You've got to talk about bench press. It's the sin qua non of barbell exercise. It's the iconic barbell exercise. You have to work the chesticles, right? You have to blast your pecs, right? Actually, it's like kind of the least ex interesting exercise to it. We like it. It helps drive up the press. It allows very large loads to be handled. It's a big confidence builder. People who can't do other exercises due to mobility limitations can almost always bench press, so we like it. But if you ask any starting strength coach, Daniel, back me up on this. It's like you got four exercises. We're going to give you three. You have to get rid of one. Which one would it be? It would be this one right here. Why? It's got the shortest kinetic chain. It trains the least amount of muscle. You can't even fall down, right? <laughs> so here's Dan at, 60, at 75, pressing, uh, bench pressing 60 pounds. You trust me, that's a big bench press for her demographic. Finally, a conditioning component. We're not going to belabor this. We like high-intensity interval conditioning because of its simplicity and its intensity. Because in intensity is a very important part of the dosing of our exercise medicine. The more intense the exercise, the more profound its bioenergetic effects, the more profound its effects on metabolism and insulin sensitivity, and, as it happens, the more time efficient it is. So we can get a similar bioenergetic and exercise capacity adaptation from 15 minutes of high-intensity interval training twice a week that we would get from running three miles three times a week. And that's known. That's all over the literature. It's one of the transformative things that's happened in exercise physiology in the last 20 years, the work of Tabata and Gibala and others. We like the sleds because the sled is simple, it's easy to learn, doesn't take much, and, and it sucks. It really, really sucks, and then it's over with, and, you get a, and it doesn't make you sore because there's no eccentric component to it. At Graysteel, we tend to use bikes a lot, and some people use the, the rower, and some people like to, to hit the heavy bag. Some people like to hit Bob. You've got this big heavy bag, you know, one of those human-shaped heavy bags. You put on 16-ounce gloves, and you go at it, right? Get your heart rate really high. So, four big barbell exercises and a conditioning component. And then the how. The program is a... The, is, a, is the prescription. The prescription is a program for the master's athlete. 
It's the program that specifies the dose, the frequency, the duration, the parameters, the, what, what physicians and nurses will call the on-off parameters of a medicine, and the modulation over time of the exercise prescription so that we keep getting a therapeutic benefit over time to the extent possible. And all of these programs, all rational training programs, and not just strength programs, all rational physical programs are built on this structure, the stress recovery adaptation cycle. Here's how it works. You come to the gym. I impose a training stress on you, or you impose a training stress on yourself. Appropriately calibrated, and when you leave the, leave the gym, you are weaker than when you came in. Yay! Right, so you go home weaker. We have disrupted homeostasis. We've caused microtrauma to muscle fibers. You are whooped when you go home. And then you eat, and you sleep, and you hydrate, and you try not to freak out over little things, and you engage in light, active rest between training bouts, and two days later, three days later, you come back to the gym, and you are stronger than when you first appeared. You have adapted to the training stress. You are stronger. You are able to absorb a larger training stress now, which I will happily deliver to you at this time. Right? And then you will absorb that training stress, you will go home whooped, you will recover, and we will repeat as necessary. This is the stress recovery adaptation cycle, and no matter how simple or how complex or how deep into the novice phase or how advanced into the elite phase that athlete is, this is the structure which will underlie that training program, no matter how complex it may seem to be on the surface. We like the starting strength model, three sets of five for most of the exercises, keeping the, the volume the same and increasing the intensity over time for the beginning athlete because it just works. It works every single time. I am here to tell you I have been a physician for a long time and I have never encountered a medicine that works every single time until now. It works every single time. It's like magic. I'm still in awe of it. That it works every single time. I'm not going to go over the details of any of these programs. I'm just showing you this to show you something that we're very proud of, how we presented the programs. This is one of our program templates. And then there are all different kinds of ways that we can modify a program template. And these templates are presented as prescriptions specifying the formulation, the frequency, the route of administration, and the indications, for example, by age, or for athletes who have certain time restrictions or certain mobility limitations. We have a prescription for every kind of athlete, for every kind of master, for every kind of aging adult. So maybe somebody can't do this rank novice program. Maybe it's more appropriate for them to have a fixed two-day rank novice program, which we kind of wouldn't like to use so much in somebody less than 40, but might be ideal for people over 60. For particularly aged or deconditioned or debilitated master's athletes, maybe we need a one-day-a-week program. Maybe that's all that they can tolerate because of their physical condition. We find the movements that they can perform and don't worry about the ones that they cannot perform. And we train those once a week, either indefinitely or until they gain enough strength that they can engage in a two-day program or a three-and-two program. So these programs are presented as prescriptions with particular indications and particular parameters. And they're broken down not, by, not just by level advancement, novice, intermediate, advanced, but also by decade of life in our book. And the book concludes with a chapter on the female master. It's the last chapter in the book. And this was not because we kind of went, oh, you know what? We should, we should put in something for the women folk. That was not it. It was because doing a chapter on the female master allowed us to bring together a lot of the themes that had been running through the book and tie them into a nice little bow. Because here's, here's the thing, right? They're, they're not a different species. 
right? At least from a training perspective, they're not that different from men. They, they should do the same program with the same exercise for the same reasons as men. There are some minor modifications that help some women make better progress. One of the most common is to go from three sets of five to five sets of three for reasons having to do with motor unit recruitment and neuromuscular integration. Women can, women can often make progress on five sets of three where men would not, right? And they can do reps closer to their one rep max. So any modifications that are required by a female master are likely to be minor, right? So it's not like, you know, well, the men will lift the big weights, and here are your pink neoprene dumbbells, honey. Right? That's not it. And we also wrote this chapter to address a particularly malignant mythology that's out there about weight training for females. And that is the horror of bulking up, right? The bulking up mythology, right? So some poor innocent lady decides that she's going to go out and get strong instead of going to Pilates class, right? And one day she wakes up and goes and looks in the bathroom mirror and it's Schwarzenegger in a nightie, right? <laughs> Horrible. Well, that never happens. That never, ever happens unless you try to make it happen and even then it doesn't happen sometimes, at least not without the use of some sort of intervention of a pharmacological and possibly illegal nature, right? Here's one of my clients. This is Janet. Janet is 66 years old. She weighs about 102, 103 pounds soaking wet, so no bulking up for her. And this is her doing the deadlift, pulling 200 pounds off the floor while I have a cow over there. <laughs> it was a great night. About a week or two later, she pulled 205. A couple of case studies and you'll be done with me. Shelly is a 65-year-old female physician, a colleague, uh, who's taking really good care of herself. She's actually not a sick aging phenotype. She's been fit most of her life. She comes to me and she says, I got a personal trainer, I train hard, I'm still losing muscle, I'm still getting weaker, I'm sore all the time, I'm not, you know, kind of like we're going in circles, you know, so I'm going to give you a chance. She has no mobility limitations. I started her on a two-day novice progression as a novice, even though she's fit. Monday, squat press deadlift. Friday, squat bench deadlift. I progressed her to an advanced novice model. Squat press deadlift on Monday. Squat bench power clean on Friday. You're not going to tell Rip, are you? Okay, right? She likes the power clean. She has an aptitude for the power clean, and she tolerates the power clean, so I let her do it. Then she eventually exhausted her novice progression, and I put her on a variant of the Texas method. You're not going to tell Rip, are you? Good. All right. Um, so on Monday, the start of the cycle, she does a very heavy set of squats. She actually does four sets of five reps on the squat at 90% of her five rep max. So that's kind of a sucky workout, right? <laughs> And then she does five by five in the press, also at 90% of her five rep max. She goes home, whoop, she comes back on Friday, recovery day. She does two sets of five at 90% of her volume day, much more manageable day, right? To keep the movement pattern alive, to keep her muscles flush with blood. And then we have her do the off-cycle pressing movement, which is the bench press, chasing singles. She warms up to a heavy single and she keeps adding weight until she gets to a new one rep max if she can. They love that. God, they love that. And then that's the day she works in power clean. And then she comes back on Monday, intensity day, and she squats a new five rep max. She presses a new five rep max, and she deadlifts a new five rep max. And then the cycle starts again on Friday with a new target five rep max. So the volume day is a little bit heavier. Intensity day is a little heavier, and recovery day is a little heavier. Now, now the off-cycle pressing movement is the overhead press, so she chases singles on the overhead press on recovery day. Repeat as necessary. And the stress recovery adaptation cycle underlies this structure. 
like it does any program no matter how advanced. Eventually, some of these lifts get heavy enough where you can't progress them to a new 5 rep max every cycle. So you have to do rotating rep ranges, well described in the book. So her current cycle deadlift target is, say, for example, 200 pounds, right? She just did 195 for a set of five in the last cycle. It was hard. We're progressing her to 200. We add five pounds to her deadlift, but we only have her, have her do it for a single three times. She does a single, she rests, she does another single, she rests, does another single, she rests. Then the following cycle, we have her do that same way. We don't add any weight to the bar, but we have her do it for a triple. And then the cycle after that, we have her do it for a set of five. And then we add weight to the bar and go again. Right? That's how we're able to continually add weight over time and make somebody stronger without burning them out. When I made up this slide, Shelly had gotten to a squat of 170 for five. She's not a big lady. She's 65 years old. That's a nice squat for a 65-year-old lady. Press 70 for five. Deadlift 200. She got up for a triple. Bench press 105. Uh, actually, it was a little bit less. It was 100 for a single. And power clean 60 for five triples. That's pretty nice for a 65-year-old lady. However, on Friday night before I left for the book tour, she had just finished an intensity day on Monday. So she had kind of a hanging chat of the day there because we didn't want to start a new cycle before I was like going to go gallivanting off across the United States. So we had ourselves a little PR day. We had ourselves a little mini me. So why don't you just chase singles today? So she chased singles. And she got 185 in the squat. She got 215 in the deadlift. And that's when she put up her, press, her bench press PR of 105 pounds. So she went home happy. Last case study, and then you're done with me. John C., 90-year-old 90, 90 male, World War II era vet. He got in like the last three months, World War II out of high school. Lives in an independent living facility. I've been, I've been to his place. He's got this nice little apartment that he lives in, right? He lives alone. He's independent, fiercely, jealously independent. But he has some mobility limitations, knees, hip, upper back. And he, st he noticed that he was getting weaker. The stairs were getting harder. Things were getting more difficult. He knew he was losing muscle. So what did he do? He went out onto the interwebs. He used a series of tubes to try to find out what he could do about it. So this guy, this guy came to me with a stack of scientific papers on resistance training in, in older adults. It's like, have you seen this? I said, yeah, I've seen it, dude. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? uh, he's... Um, he got started on a two-day novice progression, Monday squat curl deadlift, Friday squat bench deadlift. I eventually progressed him to an individualized novice model, Monday squat curl deadlift with rotating reps like we're doing with Shelly right now, advancing his weight, but slowly, carefully. Every now and then I have to step back from this guy and remind myself, dude, he's 90 years old. Right? Just, you know, he's doing great, but he's 90 years old. Friday squat bench and high intensity interval training with bike intervals, 60 seconds, as hard as you can go, right? With short rests, which he thoroughly despises, right? But he does them anyway. I once, <laughs> I, want, I, I time him on these, and once I got distracted and his timer like, it, it went like, like 10 seconds I lost on it, and he never let me forget it to this day. He monitors me really close. So he's able to do a pretty good deadlift. Most people can and everybody's noticed that he stands a little taller than he used to. You can see some of the mobility limitations in his hips and knees. He can't quite lock it out. That's okay. We're able to add weight to his bar. Bench press. He can't lay flat. He's got some curvature of the spine. He's kyphotic, and he can't lay flat without pain. But if we elevate the head of his bench just a little bit, give him his like little special special pillow here that he's very fussy about, he's able to perform this exercise and increase the weight on the bar. Curls, not a useless exercise in this population because the press is not accessible to a lot of older athletes, right? A lot of them have shoulder mobility limitations and in somebody John's age, that shoulder mobility limitation is very, very likely to be completely fixed by fixed, I don't mean repaired. By fixed, I mean permanent, right? We're unlikely to open up his shoulders with the press, and he can't perform the press safely. 
but we like the curl because it allows him to perform an upper body strengthening exercise while standing up. So once we have somebody pre or curl while standing up, we introduce the possibility that he can fall down, especially with the barbell curl because it creates this great big moment arm, right? So it's constantly changing the center of gravity. So he has to watch his balance when he's performing this exercise. And finally, the squat. Now, you might imagine that the squat could be a bit of a sticky wicket for a 90-year-old deconditioned guy, right? And it was, because when John started with us, he could not really stand out of a chair without using his arms or without assistance. So that became his squat. Sit in a chair, hold my hands, assisted chair stands. Three sets of five. Until one day, not very long after that, I was like, John, why don't you stand up out of the chair your own damn self? And so stood up unassisted, three sets of five. Cool, here's your four pound kettlebell. Stand up out of the chair with four pound kettlebell, three sets of five. Here's your eight pound kettlebell, here's your 10 pound kettlebell, here's your 15 pound kettlebell. And then when we get to a 15 pound kettlebell, you know, John, it's funny, we have a 15 pound bar in the gym. So why don't we just put that bad boy on your back because it's the same weight as the kettlebell you're standing up with. And then we were off to the races because that bar accepts standard plates. And we set up this sort of strap mechanism with him here that allows him to carry the bar on his back in the low bar squat position and added weight to the bar, standing up out of the chair. And then eventually we said, you know, John, that's great. You're increasing your weight, standing up out of the chair with the, with the barbell. There always has to be something under his butt. His proprioception is not good and it's probably not coming back. So we always need something, a reporter. He's not going to sit on it. He doesn't sit on it. He doesn't settle his weight into it. It's a reporter that says, oh, you should hip drive now and stand up. But that chair, that's above parallel. And we like the below parallel squat. So why don't we have you start squatting below parallel? So we got him a box that would allow him to squat below parallel. And about a week ago, John was warming up to his work set here with this set of 65 on the bar. And that's his squat. Now, when we do this, because it's just a strap on his bar there, I like to stand there and just sort of lightly hold one end of the bar to make sure that it stays stable on his back. So I filmed the set at 65, but he got up to 93 for three sets of five that day. Pretty good squat. Kind of a badass, actually. Um, so 93 on the squat, 47 and a half on the curl. So the deadlift, so the deadlift thing, he was supposed to get uh, on Monday last, he was supposed to get uh, a single 130. That was going to be his new PR. 130 for, for a single, right? Because that's how we're rotating him up. And he said, well, I want to do three. I said, yeah, but what you, you going to do a single. I said, I feel strong today. I'm going, I feel like I can do three and you're going to be gone. And so why don't I just do three? And it's like, John, you're supposed to do one. And we're trying to be like careful with you. It's like, I want to do, th he kind of runs the place now. And so I'm like, you know what? Fine. Uh, you know, if one looks good and I don't have to stop you and, you know, it feels neat, then you can do three. So he gets out and he does one, he does two and he does three. And they, I thought, great. That's great. And he puts the third one down, and he doesn't let go of the bar, and he just looks at me. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, dude. Like, you know, I'm going to stop you. So, yeah, that's, he got his set of five. So, pretty proud of him. Bench 57, he's looking for 60. So, conclusion, you should buy our book. The conclusion is that the exercise prescription for the aging adult is a training program for the master's athlete. And that's what this book describes. We make human movement patterns stronger using barbells because it's safe, it's dosable, it's comprehensive, it attacks the sick aging phenotype, and it's simple and efficient. And as I've just shown you, this approach is available to almost everybody. Almost everybody can use this approach to get stronger and healthier, and instead of just being another aging adult, become an athlete of aging, a master's athlete. That's what I want. That's what I hope. I want to thank my co-author, Andy Baker, my publisher, Mark Ripito and Steph Bradford, the philosopher Nassim Taleb, who uh, never writes book forwards but wrote one for us, my fellow starting strength coaches, and tonight a special 
especially Daniel Raimondi, uh, who hosted me, uh, all of you for coming, uh, and all of my wonderful clients who are my constant inspiration. Um, thank you very much for your attention.